Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our fifth and final series with Gertrude Mueller Nelson uh, for to talk about Lent and Holy Week and um, and explore it's I I guess past, present, and future, just what it means and uh, and how we can incorporate uh, uh, Lenten practices into our lives. Um, let's say a prayer, and then I'll turn it over. Uh, to Gertrude, I'll just mention that next week on Palm Sunday, we will have, um, is Stacy here? Yes, I'm here. Dr. Christian Ramers, who's an infectious disease specialist at Family Health Centers in San Diego. Um, he will be speaking and answering questions about COVID-19. And Stacy, what should we do if we have a question about COVID-19? I will put my email in the chat. You could send me any questions that you have. Um, you could also ask them the day of the forum. Okay, great. Um, and if you didn't know, Stacy is the new chair of the Adult Formation Committee. So if you have ideas for adult forums or seasonal formation offerings, uh, she is uh, the chair of that committee now. And we have several other folks from that committee uh, present as well. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, as we continue our journey into Lent, this fifth week of Lent, open our eyes, open our ears, deepen our senses, our sense of touch, smell, all of our whole being, that we may with all of our body and mind and soul be drawn nearer to you. We may turn towards you with our whole selves and be made anew once again into your love for us transformed by your love for us, into your love for us. Bless this time of formation that we may be changed by it so that we may be your, made yours once again. All these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> Today's presentation is going to be much more patchworky than <clears throat> we've been in the past. And it's going to be much more about that tactile part of us, that those things that Jeff just mentioned are very humanness, our, our creative selves, our seeing and smelling and being and tasting. So, Excuse me if I sort of patch things together today because we've got all the rest of Holy Week and Easter itself ahead of us. The other thing that I find difficult is to be talking about Easter things when we haven't even gotten into Palm Sunday. So bear with me while I sort of stutter my way through uh, too many days and too many ideas all at once. So fasten your seatbelts. Here we go. First of all, we've got Palm Sunday coming up and there are wonderful images. We will be, you will be picking up your palms, I think in the Queen's Courtyard next Sunday and bringing them home. What to do with those palms? How to understand them? Now, in Europe, in parts of Germany, you, bring your own greenery from your garden, whatever is indigenous and is a sign of spring, because not every place has palms as we do. And not every place orders them from some place in Florida and has them mailed to the church. The idea is you take something that you find in your own garden and you say, ah, it's spring. We said that this week, it's spring. We're seeing it and there is indeed 
some magic thing that happens about the moon and the sun and but uh, Easter being a lunar feast, all of a sudden everything starts to bloom. You wait. When Easter comes, it's going to look different again and it it's magic. In Europe, you also might take a pole and try bun tie bunches at the top with ribbons of oh like a box trees, box bushes, those 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 wonderful hedges that people have that have little tiny green leaves on that last forever. They turn yellow, but there they stand. And in the midst of this nest of green, you might put the image of a hen. Why? Why a hen? Because Jesus looked on the city of Jerusalem and wept. This Jerusalem that he was going toward, he knew all that we are seeing, in fact. And he wept and he said, how I wish I could, like a mother hen, gather you as chicks under my wings. Jeff, I think there's a a bookmark with the picture of a chicken on a nest as one of those images. Did you find let it? Me, let me find it and I'll come, I'll come back. Sure, it's long and skinny. Okay. <laughs> and that hen shows up on Palm Sunday, because we too would like to be like chicks and scurry under the wings of the Lord and be kept warm and safe there. So many times, Jesus is spoken of as our mother and even as our mother hen. So there it comes up in the Palm Sunday processions in the south of Germany. And the corner of your house, the main room in your house is the holy place where two sides, two walls come together. That's where you hang your family crucifix. And that's where you stick your palms, your greenery, maybe your mother hen. Sometimes the mother hen is made out of bread dough. Last year for Palm Sunday, one of your parishes asked me to come and make with the children there, those kind of processional sticks with ribbons, with flowers, with palms, and they had, there it is. Okay, so here's the whole story this was written by saint anselm and you jesus are you not also a mother are you not the mother who like a hen gathers her chickens under her wings truly lord you are a mother for both they who are in labor and they who are brought forth are accepted by you you have died more than they and they may labor to bear life it is your death that they have been born. It is by your death that they have been born. For if you had not been in labor, you would not have borne death. And if you had not died, you would not have brought forth life. For longing to bear your children into life, you taste of death and by dying, you begot them. And so you, Lord God, are the great mother. Even if you are father, you are also mother. For you have brought it about that those born to death should be reborn to life, you by your own act, and so forth. I think if you wanted a copy of this, you would have to talk to Jeff, 
who would maybe email it to you. There will be several things that come up that you might want to have copies of. So if you leave behind an email with Jeff, that might help. Yeah, how about we put it on the website? Oh, that's a good idea. We'll put the whole slideshow on the website. All right. So sometimes I have made little bread dough chicks with whole families, of course, with our family. And one time we discovered that if you go to a, a Mexican bakery, they have those wonderful bolillos. They almost look like a chick already. All you have to do is add a tail and a stick and your greens. And then what do you do? You bring those palms home and you don't quite know what to do with them. No, you have a procession, a family procession. And even if you live by yourself, you have a procession. And you walk about the house and you leave behind in holy corners a spray of palms. Um, Jeff, can you put up the picture of the cross? We go from that happy processional Palm Sunday immediately into hearing the Passion. And the juxtaposition is just here as Anselm put it, it's life and death, it's death that brings life. And you put your palms by your cross. And later in the week, <clears throat> especially if we aren't able to go to church and have a, a good Friday procession, there is that incredible reading that you need to find, that procession where the cross is carried down the aisle and is exposed, behold, the wood of the cross, ecce lignum. It's a beautiful chant. It's a mourning chant. It's a weeping chant. Behold, the wood of the cross on which hung the savior of the world. This is a cross that comes from Mexico. It's folk art. Um, the angel on the side is made out of pieces of palm. In Mexico, you decorate the whole hood of your car with sprays of palms. Um, you braid them in very special ways and you hang them in your house. We're much more shy about what to do with our palms than other countries. Oh, if you could see what they have in Rome and they have the Pope carry. It's a big long stick and it's palms that have been braided into arabesques on all sides. And everybody has one of these and those are sometimes, you know, three feet tall. So we go from room to room, from the garage to the shed. And we leave a little bit of this always to remind us that through the death of Christ came life and that we would hail him were we in that procession. And we would sing Hosanna. Oh, there's a picture of a donkey. Jeff, can you give us that? Yes. <laughs> when I, uh, uh, people contact me from all over the world because they've read to dance with God and they like it. And there was a woman in England who was telling me about their posada that they have in a small village in England and all the the people of the Holy Family and the shepherds and the kings and so on are all these net creatures and they go from house to house in the village during Advent asking for shelter, asking if Mary and Joseph could stay there because a baby is about to be born. And every year, by the time it comes to Christmas and they're all supposed to come back to the church crash, the donkey is always missing because in every household, everybody gets to keep the Holy Family and the donkey. 
for a day before it gets processed to the next household. And when the priest goes to visit various sick old people, eventually he sees the donkey on top of the TV that somebody has managed to kidnap the donkey because they loved the donkey so much. And I laughed and I told her when she showed me pictures, I said, oh, I would kidnap such a donkey too if I could. How interesting it is when you see a real for sure donkey that it has a cross going right down its back and over its shoulders. You don't see it on this knit donkey. She has to go back and look at donkeys to see exactly where that cross is. But of course, there are all endless beautiful children's songs and so on that talk about this donkey that started out in Bethlehem and ended up on Palm Sunday carrying Christ. That the donkey bears that emblem across its shoulders in memory of its holy vocation. And the donkey was not some fancy steed, some gorgeous horse, some um, Arabian beauty, but the humblest of beasts. So what did she do? She made me a donkey and sent it in a box in time for Palm Sunday last year, which was very sweet. So I share that with you. That's my donkey. Thank you. There are other Palm Sunday pictures, if you want to put them on, Jeff, that are pretty amazing. Um, this was done for a clip art book that you perhaps know. Yeah, I'll take another. And this one too. We would be there if we could. We would take our shawl off and put it on the ground. We would wave whatever we could pick and we would shout and sing. Look at this one, it comes from Ethiopia. It's wonderful. There come the shirts off, you see they're being laid out. And Christ and the donkey are surrounded by greenery. I love this one. Next. And this is by that famous Japanese Christian artist. Watanabe is his name. And there you see the shirts across the ground and the flowers and the palms and people up in the trees breaking down more branches and birds flying past and Christ riding by on that wonderful donkey. That's next Sunday. And perhaps because things have to be limited, all the more reason to bring home action and involvement be the domestic church and where our presence in the bigger groups are is limited all the more we need to do something at home whether we have family there or whether we are all by ourselves There will be a lot of bringing home in the next weeks and making home our domestic church. And those of us who are grandparents, it's our job to share traditions, to tell the stories, to have the processions, to involve the children. We're the ones who carry traditions forward for the younger generation. That's our job and it's a lovely job. I told you last time that 
during the Easter Vigil, we get the stories that tell us who we are as a people. I told you the story of the Hopi Indians who have an initiation rite where they also dance and sing and hear from the elders the stories of their tradition, the stories of who they are. And that on the last year in their adolescence, when they are invited down into the Kiva for the first time, the gods from the mountains, the Kachinas come down and are not wearing their masks and their ceremonial vestments, but they're coming down exactly as their fathers and their uncles and their big brothers. And the stories and the dances go on as always, and nothing is said. And then they disappear back into the village and the youngsters are left without words to decide what this means. Now that we see that the gods and the work of the gods is done in the village by our own people, we've been invited to leave this place knowing that we assist in the work of the gods. This is our invitation to join the adults and the, and the elders in bringing forward God's work. During the Easter Vigil, those stories are told. And as I said, we so often shorten everything so quickly because we don't want anybody to get tired or bored and then they won't come next year. And so we keep truncating things where the very definition of this time, Holy Saturday, going through the vigil to Easter Sunday, is supposed to be long. It's supposed to be tiring. It's supposed to be astonishing. You're supposed to be shivering with cold and sleepiness and wanting your beddy. And yet you hear the stories grown on and they come in through your heart and through the membranes of your skin and you hear who we are every year. Here's a story. <clears throat> to those of you, this is a, a sermon, a short introduction by a priest named Brian Helga. He says, those of you who are not of the host, ha, household of faith, what we're about to do must look very peculiar. We're about to stand in the dark, carry candles around, sing lengthy and sublime religious texts, read stories from the Bible. What does this all mean? What is going on here in this community? I think that I first came to understand what this was all about and why I came to think that this was one of the most important things in my whole life was when I read The Lord of the Rings by Tolkien. In their wanderings and meanderings, two of the main characters called hobbits meet a talking tree called an ent, and they introduce themselves and the conversation proceeds. Hello, I'm Brandy Book, Meridoc Brandy Book, though most people call me just Mary. And I'm Took, Peregrin Took, but I'm generally just called Pippin or even Pip. Mm. But you are hasty folk, I see, said Treebeard. I'm honored by your confidence. But you should not be too free all at once. There are ants and ants, you know. Or there are ants and things that look like ants but ain't, as you might say. I'll call you Mary and Pippin, if you please, nice names. For I am not going to tell you my name. Not yet, at any rate. A queer, half-knowing, half-humorous look came from a green flicker into his eyes. For one thing, it would take a very long while. My name 
is growing all the time and I've lived a very long, long time. So my name is like a story. Real names tell you the story of things they belong to in my language. In the old Entish, as you might say. It's a lovely language, but it takes a very long time to say anything in it. Because we do not say anything in it unless it is worth taking a long time to say and to listen to. To use Treebeard's mode of expression, we're not going to be hasty folk tonight, satisfied with glibly saying the name Christian. Tonight, you might say, is old Entish, an old Entish night in the church. Tonight, we're going to tell our names to ourselves by way of reminder to those who will become part of us this night through baptism and confirmation and to those of the world who would listen, who will take time to hear what our name is. And our name is a very long one, one that has been growing since the creation of the world. Our name is a very long story of how we became who we are, how we were made, of how God chose us from all peoples, of how God liberated us from bondage, of how God planted us in the promised land, of how in these last times, God has given the story a new twist, given our name meaning in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Because we've been here for so long, it takes a long time to tell who we are and to recount the story of our life as a people. And none of us would be here if we did not think that name was worth telling and listening to. Now, the trick to this kind of name telling is to relax. You cannot be hasty in this time ahead of us. Haste would stop up our ears finally, and then you will not hear this lovely language in our beautiful name. So relax. Make yourself comfortable in the darkness. And don't even try to make sense of the name. Just hear it. Let it roll over you in waves of meanings. Tonight, we're going to listen to a series of episodes not write a theological treatise on the resurrection, a practical word about relaxing. If you need to get up and move around, do so. If you need a breath of fresh air, go on out and get it. We'll be telling the story when you rejoin us. Whatever you need to do to stay comfortable, do it. All of this will enable you to hear the lovely language in which we can really name ourselves as God himself has named us. Christian is merely an inadequate abbreviation for what we are about to tell. I used to encourage parents, bring your children to the Easter vigil. Oh, they said it's so long. Yeah, you bring them in their pajamas. They can bring their blankie and their pillow. They can sleep on the bench if they want, but they want to be there to see the blessing of the fire outside, a real roaring fire that gets blessed. And then that incredible pillar of light, the Easter candle is lit and carried in procession. And the light is shared. And I remember my kids saying, you know, when you share fire, you don't get less, you get more. There aren't very many things. I mean, if I have to share my donut with my sister, I only get half. But with fire, we share it. And pretty soon, the whole church is alight with firelight. Oh, yes, in the exalted, it sings about that about that fire that we share. And that's evermore 
And that's the same with love. Love doesn't divide, it multiplies. Now, I get nervous because fire departments don't like us when we have ceremonies like this. And I kind of think we got to cheat and do it anyhow. Because the idea of sort of flicking on your phone doesn't do it for me. It has to be that fire. And you know everybody is alive and well when we're doing things with fire. We would be so careful. Jeff, can you show us a couple of uh, Paschal candles? This is done by uh, Ralph Karskaden, now in heaven. But you will notice at the very bottom, there's a bee. Do you see the bee at the bottom of the candle of his design? He has the cross. He has the five wounds under which is put a grain of incense. Those four directions are blessed in the blessing of the candle. The alpha and the omega are put on that candle. And at the bottom of the candle, just see it right there. It's very visible. There is a bee. Because if you sing the long version of the exalted, it praises Holy Mother B, who has given us the wax for this pillar of fire. We all know the trouble our bees are in. We all know what a colossal role they play in our ecology. That without our bee to pollinate and all our pollinators, we wouldn't be able to eat. And in the ancient church, the beauty of the exalted that is sung after this blessing of fire outside and the pillar of fire is brought in procession, light of Christ to the front of the church and the deacon climbs up and sings to this candle and sings, if it isn't cut out, to Holy Mother the Bee who has given us the wax for this candle. And all of us are holding our candles and seeing that flame from that fire out there that was blessed there. They used to hang down from the pulpit a long scroll that was written upside down for the singer but right side up for those as the scroll slowly but surely fell over the edge and down, 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 so the people could see it. It was all done in beautiful calligraphy and illuminated with images. And most of the images were about bees and beekeepers. I didn't bring you a picture of it, but you can look it up online. You can see these incredible scrolls, beautiful, where the whole song of the exalted is unfolded and falls down before us with images to look at. The Exalted is what I think it's the most powerful piece of poetry that the church gives us. And that's why it has to be chanted beautifully. And it's all about what we've talked about since the beginning of these forums, all the opposites coming together and overlapping and becoming one. A night that is bright as day. A death that has brought us life. Fire and water, not putting each other out, but enhancing each other. Heaven and earth have become one, have married each other. It's not a lollipop in the sky for us to get one day if we behave ourselves. Heaven and earth are here for us. And ceremony and ritual are designed 
to make that alive and well, individually and as a community. That's why liturgy is so important, that it be generous and beautiful and fun and shocking. There was another candle, but maybe I'm wrong. Let me just look. I don't see it. But some of you may have known Ralph Karsgadden many years ago because he did some of the vestments for the cathedral, which I believe you still use. But he was a fabulous liturgist and an artist. And the making of the Easter candle every year was a big thing. And I have several pictures of them, but somehow they got lost in the shuffle. But know that the decoration of that candle, this is the only candle that ever gets a decoration because candles are symbols in their own right. They don't need to be tarted up. But here, it's prescribed that it has the cross and the alpha and the omega, which is again another saying, you know, beginning and end are all of a piece. The first letter, the last letter, it's the all together, it's all whole. It's of a piece. We talked about the central theme of baptism and of that baptismal water being blessed and having a cross in it and of that candle being dipped three times into the womb of the church, the font of the church, out of which we are all born. And we renew our baptismal vows along with the newly baptized. We remember what has become dismembered in our memories about our promises in baptism. Who are we? What is our name in this church? And once again, fire and water do not quench each other. We remember in the story, the business of the Israelites passing through the Red Sea. They went through the sea and they stayed dry. Opposites again. And yet we go through that Red Sea also in our baptism into the promised land. It's central. Patchwork quilt, let's see. What else can we share? Someone wondered last time, why was the egg, surely the egg was a pagan symbol. Um, it was, it's an ancient symbol. It's a forever, it's a total miracle, you know, that a bird lays this perfect package, the most amazing packaging that anyone could invent is this egg. And this package carries life inside of it and cracks open and a new beginning comes from it. It's like the tomb opening. The Egyptians put them with their dead. We find that there are eggs used all over in anthropology because they have such a profound meaning. We may eat one every morning for breakfast and not think of it, but on Easter, we elevate it and we remember it. And remember it for what a wonderful thing it is. I brought pictures of eggs for Jeff to show. Was there something else I was supposed to show before we got to the eggs? Okay, here's eggs. Over here on the right in the bowl, you'll see the traditional Pazanki. Pazanki come from Eastern Europe, the Russians, the Bulgarians, everybody makes, the women make these incredible eggs that have all meaning and symbol. And they stay up all night in silence, creating those eggs because it's a meditation. 
It's an artwork and a meditation, but you have to stay concentrated and quiet. They're wonderful to make and some of you have learned how to do it. Um, in the circle, you will see not Pazankis, but using the same concept, the use of uh, wax and different colors that my kids made over the years. One of them is uh, a dyed with the uh, onion skins that we'll talk about. But because the Pazanki just looked too scary to try, they made their own designs, but using the same method. And we brought home the Easter fire to put on a candle at home. That's a tricky thing, but it was an old thing and we don't do that anymore either, but do it. Bring with you a bottle, a beautiful bottle with a stopper and take home some of that blessed Easter water and bring it home and keep it someplace when you need to be reminded of your baptismal promises, of those ceremonies that you had together on Easter night. Trying to bring home the fire in the back of the car, somebody holding it in a jar the bottom of a jar, that's the best way is to bring a jar with a candle in the bottom of it. Gets to be an amazing adventure. I remember doing this with a parish in the great Northwest in Seattle. And of course it was blustery and raining out and having this fire and making it work and bringing home the fire and the water it was a time when a lot of hippies were living in the woods, you know, to be close to nature. And they heard they did interesting things like bring home fire and water. So they all came to the church being totally unchurched and were stunned by the Easter vigil. And then this idea of going out into the blustery parking lot and getting back into your VW van, right? Which was all painted up hippie style. That's the way it was in those days. You brought your fire in and you discovered that if you slammed the door shut, your fire went out. And then you had to run back out into the parking lot and go to somebody else and say, watch it, give me another flame because mine went out. And when you get into your VW, they're so airtight, you have to leave the window open and then slam the door and then you'll keep your. And so the whole ceremony went on in the back in the parking lot with everybody in the rain and the wind trying to get that flame home. It was like another sacramental. And people had bottles with stoppers and had gone bloop, 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 bloop into the fountain and gotten Easter water to bring home. And Easter water blesses your new car. And Easter water blesses your children when they have an exam they're afraid of. And Easter water blesses us when we have to give a presentation to the corporation. And Easter water blesses children every night before they sleep so that they're not afraid. Always remember, it's not magic water. It's not for the ego. It's mystery water, not magic. And how quickly in some countries it becomes a magic thing. Holy water, you know, lots of interesting. Well, that's okay. We get stuck there. We're very close on the edge between Abba Globe, what's that word in English? Sometimes words come to me in German that I can't find in English. Um, in any case, it's not, it's not magic. It's holy mystery. 
but they're very close to each other. Okay, very close. All right, what else do we have to show, Jeff? Oh yes, eggs, you can blow out eggs too. Do you know how to prick a little hole in the top of a raw egg? At the top and at the bottom. And then you do a lot of blowing into a bowl and egg yolk and egg white fall into the bowl and you have to make some kind of cakes out of those. But then when you have a hollow egg, you can string them up like this. And this is a family's worth of drawn eggs, painted, drawn, done with wax, all different ways. And some of them were our own chickens. And so they have their natural color. I still have them someplace in my garage, but I, you know, it's still lint. And so I haven't gone climbing up there to get the right boxes down. So these are pictures from the past. Easter breakfast, and it's not there to be seen, but making a pizanki, uh, uh, no, making a, a coolidge, an, a resurrection bread is a loaf that is made tall. It's like saying we're done with the flat breads of the Passover where we couldn't have yeast. Now we do the opposite and we make a loaf. We used to use coffee tins when coffee came in tins. Now we use um, parchment paper and bake a loaf of bread of sweet dough that has chopped dried fruits, cherries and and apricots and nuts and lovely things in this tall mushroom shaped loaf of bread. The Russians always put one skinny tall candle in the top and it usually has a little icing dripped over the whole thing. And it's once again, we had bread without yeast and now we have bread with yeast. And there are blessings. Did you know that? There are blessings for every Easter food that we eat. There are blessings for the eggs, for the bread, for the meats that we can eat again, for the cakes. Unless we've been fasting, it won't make sense and it won't be especially fun. So, you got another crack at fasting in these next two weeks before Easter comes and really doing without all of those fine things so that when Easter comes, it's fabulous. Yes, you have your, your arrow on the right one. Can you do that one? Number 11. Perfect. Here again are the eggs that are dyed with uh, onion skins. How do you do this? I'm going to tell you now. You go to the grocery store, not where they sell you the onions already packaged in a little sack, but where they're free. And you fondle the onions. And the papery skins come off. If you're caught fondling the onions, you'll never be able to run for office. So be careful or ask the guy in charge of produce to save skins for you. But I went last week and I got myself a goodly plastic bag full of red and yellow. The white onions won't give you color. And you take a raw egg, remember this, a raw egg. And you go outside, you know, this one here, that one, the big daisy, that's one of those freeway daisies that we see all the time, you know, with the blue center and the white petals and there's parsley and there's uh, clovers and there's celery leaf. I see all these different, um, you take the egg and you make it wet so that the leaf will stick to it. You can even wet the leaf. 
And then you wet the onion skin so that they will stick too. And they go over it and you just patch them up all around the egg. And then you take a swatch of the best thing is nylon stockings. And if you have to go buy some at the dollar store, because none of us wear those stockings anymore, do it for this occasion. And you make a square and you wrap it around nice and tight so that everything is right against this, the, the shell of the egg so it, it's on the wall. And then you tie the ends, you know, like a bonbon with twisties on each side, nicely stretched. Did you get that? Once again, so wet the onion skins, wet the flour, wet the egg so that they stick to each other. And the onion skin wrapped around the egg and then the treacle knit fabric so that stretches nice and tight around it, tied tight on both ends. And you can use rubber bands, but I'll tell you twisties are great. And I think I did tell you that Sprout still has twisties, I think. So I save mine. I've got all the stockings and the twisties from a hundred years put away in my Easter box so that I don't have to go through that search again. But onion skins, you better start collecting them now because you'll need a few. If you have plenty left over that aren't around the eggs, you're now going to boil these eggs just as you would boil your hard boiled eggs and you throw in any leftover onion skins that you have because they'll die through the cloth. And I learned yesterday from a Russian person, cut up a beet and throw that in the water too. And the beet would make it even redder. Now what's the story with the red egg? Why do the Greeks have only red eggs? I forgot to include in my picture collection here, Jeff, I had some icons of Mary Magdalene holding a red egg. She apparently went and told the, the emperor, Christ is risen from the dead. And he said, oh, there they are, okay. I thought I'd forgotten. Oh, and there's the bread too. Oh, see, okay. Put them all up here. And then the emperor said, well, you know, if he's risen from the dead, then that egg is red and it turned red. That's what the mythology is. So you have these ancient icons. And in Greece, all the Easter eggs are red. That's all they are. And they, and they have a special dye that's absolutely fabulous. Greatness, a third one. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. There she has her alabaster jar as well. And Jeff, I see we have the the coolidge, the, the bread that's tall. There, there it is. There's the bread that's tall. So this would be a new take when all our bread baking during this pandemic, we can learn how to make one sweet loaf that is risen. Okay, I see lots more eggs you can show. Let's do that. That one, there you see how they have been uh, not wrapped in the onion skins. The onion skins are put extra next to the little packages of egg with um, leaves on them. So that's another way to do it. You bathe them in this whole soup of, of, of egg, of um, onion skins. You can see the onion skins around them. And you could see where a couple slices of red beet would add a lot of color to that. Perfect. And here's some more of the beautiful, oh, Pajanki eggs. And this is done with red cabbage. Red cabbage makes this fabulous blue color. 
when you slice that up and put it into the pot. All right, and we were gonna talk about making baskets with real grass in them. Get yourself a basket and line it with foil or plastic and fill it with some potting soil and get some rye grass seeds and sprinkle it over the top and spritz spritz with a spray bottle, some water on it and keep it moist and put it someplace in the light. And from Palm Sunday to Easter morning, you will have, yes, that one, you will have grass. And if that isn't beautiful to put eggs in, as opposed to plastic and whatever else we use, and what a gift to find it or to bring it to a neighbor or a friend. Isn't that fabulous? There is, yes, that one is Easter water and Easter fire brought home. Now our kids really got into this business of no bells ringing, right? Remember there's that clapper that makes a noise? Well, that was to substitute the bells that didn't ring after the Gloria, which we sing one time during Lent, and that's on Holy Thursday because of the, the institution of the sacrament of the Eucharist. We sing the Gloria and we ring the bells through it and then the clappers are put down, that's it. Now, if we lived in a European town where every hour on the hour we know what time it is by hearing the church bell, all of a sudden we don't know what time it is or where we are because the bells aren't ringing. I lived in a small village up above the Main River one time during the Easter season and the adolescent boys have a job. They have that clapper thing. And when the hour comes, they go through the town and instead of hearing the bells, you hear the kids with their clappers, but uh, they love this. I mean, boys making noise, that's perfect. So they're clapping this wooden thing on the hour and they're chanting the Our Father and the Hail Mary. And then they disappear again. And then on oh, the next hour, they get to come out again. And I was in an old castle on this, on this hillside that looked down on the Main River and on the other side of the valley, you saw little villages and you could hear there every hour from each village, clapper, 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 clapper and the Our Father and these adolescent voices being chanted out loudly. So the return of the bell is another big thing during that singing of that A word, right? During when that comes back during the Easter vigil, we bring our bells from home. Everybody has a muffled bell in a basket in the church. They've got it wrapped up in a hanky or stuffed with Kleenex or something so it won't make a noise when it shouldn't. And they have an empty bottle to collect Easter water and they have some way of bringing the Easter fire home. Okay, that goes with it. Our kids wouldn't even let the alarm clocks or the doorbell ring during that time. And they put tape over the doorbell in case somebody might ring it. And they woke us up with a clapper at the right time. The other thing about the fire that they wanted is we blew out the pilot lights and rekindled them with Easter fire. And they said, and now when we take a shower and have hot water, or when we fry eggs in the morning, we know that the pilot lights have been lit that night from that sacred fire. And we have it here for the rest of the year. I mean, they really took it all away. It was that powerful a symbol. Imagine you would do that. It was a little, creepy blowing out fire uh, pilot lights and relighting them, but we did it. Okay, more pictures. Oh yeah, that's a little strife rabbit that somebody gave us. And that's an egg that my daughter, one of my daughters did. Okay. And there's 
a goose and there's the beautiful Pazankis. And they're the ones we made. And there's Holy Mother the bee. Do something for the bees. Plant a garden with all pollinating wildflowers for the bees and the butterflies to pollinate. That's a good springtime job. And honor the bees. Here's a rabbit I made out of paper. Um, I just drew him on the computer and doubled him so that he had a, two sides and then cut him out and folded him. Took a nip here and a poke there and a, poked his tail up in the air. You can make these things. You can make them too. Here's another beautiful Palm Sunday image. Yeah, the Sunday after Easter, is it the Sunday after? Is Trinity something? I think that's, that's it. And the rabbits are still running around. And here you have an image that speaks of the Trinity. You've got three rabbits, but there are only three ears. And yet every rabbit has two ears. Those plays on Trinity. This one is an Irish one. Do you see the shamrock? You see that wonderful Celtic weaving of, that's, that's a, a, a Celtic image of the Trinity. And I have to tell you in this week where we had the Feast of St. Patrick, which is also the Feast of St. Gertrude of Nivelle, I'm sorry to say, I always feel a little sidelined by Patrick, but nonetheless, Everybody was greeting everybody else with Irish blessings and greetings. And you know that most of the shamrocks were good luck. Shamrock four leaf clovers, which were not shamrocks. And people actually wished each other happy, happy four leaf clover day. So you see how it went from a symbol of the Trinity to a good luck thing. Don't let that happen the holy things. Don't give it that final twist of where it loses its originality and its ancient roots. Okay, try another one. As I say, patchwork quilt. And we always loved singing the Compline anthems to Mary. Be happy, Mary, heavenly queen, Gaude Maria, for Christ your son, was living scene. The idea of what that must have, that resurrection must have been like for Mary after all she had gone through. So she always got special attention. Oh, there's that rabbit, by the way, that all of you can make one like that. You see, that's how it started out. And you fold him down the middle and cut his, his, his ears loose and flick up his tail. This is our Easter cake. It's called paradise cake. It's a recipe my mother found in a newspaper in the 20s. Okay. And it's totally counterintuitive. But the recipe is in the book to dance with God. You make four layers of a kind of a hard cookie like dough. And each of them is spread with crumbled marzipan and egg white that's been whipped up. So it has a kind of a little meringue on the top. Then you whip up um, whipped cream. And you put whipped cream between each layer and you turn the top cake upside down so you have a smooth surface. And the cake is about that tall. And then you put it in a cool, dry place, not in the fridge. Maybe covered only with an inverted bowl or kettle, but not, um, don't make it air free. It needs air and it sinks. The whipped cream goes inside each layer. 
and in a week it's ready to eat. Can you imagine? It's an amazing cake and it's super easy to make. So the recipe for it is is in to dance with God if you're interested in trying that. Well, my friends, it's been so much fun being with you each Sunday. And I hope you have something stuck to your Velcro that you can save and that you can use and that you can carry with you into this time which is the holiest time of the year and which is being challenged by this strange plague that has affected us so that so much more responsibility is our own responsibility as it really always is to make these feasts come alive and come home with us and stay with us all year long Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. Are there any questions? Do we want to ask, make additions or corrections? You can unlock your voice if you want to say something. You're, you're very welcome. I was running around yesterday doing grocery shopping and Stater Brothers has twist ties in its vegetable department where the bags are. Excellent. And they also, I found out that if you lift up the onions in a bin, a given bin, yes. there's often onion skins underneath the onions. And you can- They have fallen them. off, exactly. You <laughs> grab all those too, that's right. And you loosen a few others. <laughs> I want to start a movement to restore the bee to the exultant. Yeah. Oh, please do, it is in the exultant. <laughs> You know, in our got, book, though. no, I know it. Yeah. You have to go online. Actually, you can find it. You can, can find, find but it. But please restore the bee. We need to restore the bee in, in any case. And how stunning. I mean, oh, that's another thing you can find online are pictures of these squirrels that went over the edge of the pulpits, way down. You know, the pulpits were way up higher than yours. And this scroll would come rolling down with all the words of the exalted mm -hmm. and all the pictures of the bees and the beekeepers were all over it. They were beautiful. Restore the exalted. Mm -hmm. Dick is going to restore the Jerusalem dance for everybody who wants to. <laughs> You know, they go out in the parking lot someplace, though, to have enough room. <laughs> no. <laughs> we we'll have lots of room when we take the pews out. Yes. That's <laughs> true. That's what it's made for. Look up the dance. Uh, just look up Jerusalem. It comes Jerusalem. out of South Africa. Mm -hmm. it's Zulus. Some two Zulus made this song about Jerusalem as our home. And there's a line dance. And apparently it started out that they, they didn't do this dance at weddings. And you're supposed to be able to eat at the same time that you're doing the dance. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was a, yeah, they were eating, right? Yeah. That's right. I mean, that's worse than chewing gum and walking. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's dancing and and in eating dinner. So that's how, how it started the dance part. Um, it's pretty lovely. So what stuck, what stuck with you from the whole five weeks that we've done this? Mm -hmm. wow. take, take your, take your, unlock your voice if you would like to say something. I think your analogy with the Hopis and with the vigil uh, is very, uh, uh, what should uh, I say, Re uh, remembering. <laughs> remembering, always remembering what has become dismembered. It's the only way. Why is this night like no other night, the Jewish feast in the Passover? This you is who to, we are. You have to say it again. The youngest asks so that the youngest gets the answer so that it can keep coming forward. We have to do that. And we 
who are the elders. That's our job. That's our job. I think what, what strikes me is looking back, remembering back to week one, when you ask us to go outside and stand on the earth with bare yeah. feet, yes. to today with the imagery of the eggs and the rabbits and the, uh, the bees, yeah. um, the connection uh, that the liturgy has had with nature all of creation um, yeah. and all of our senses that yeah. has you know throughout the vast couple of hundred years or so it's just become so heavy and exactly. to, to restore that holistic sense of integration with this world and with our bodies yes. um, that, that was really meaningful to me well your prayer brought it up again too you know our senses are the ones that bring the blessing within what we feel and taste and smell. And that's why water and fire and oil and bread and wine have to be real and generous. Not just hints, not, it's only a symbol. Oh no, it's far more than only a symbol. Yeah. Draws you into the holy. Uh-huh. Well, I thank you, all of you. Thank you, Gertrude. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And blessings on this Holy Week in Easter to all of you. Thank you. Blessings to you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you so much, Gertrude. See you in church. <laughs>